Advertising and Marketing 2.0. And to do that, we have with us uh, Mike Karen from Convert Golf Marketing. Mike is the president and founder of Convert Golf Marketing, which is a full service marketing firm specializing in providing comprehensive online solutions for golf courses and management companies. He's also the president and founder of Micro Communications, which is an online marketing uh, strategy and an implementation implementation firm and Mr. Karen has founded the clickfortetimes.com in 2001 and was later acquired by the Active Network in 2006. So please welcome Mike Karen. Thank you very much. Well, that took my whole intro. That was supposed to take about 15 minutes of my speech there. So uh, let's go from there. Well, well I appreciate everybody uh, coming. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about uh, marketing today and uh, hopefully learn and be able to uh, take a few things home right away and be able to execute on those things. So, uh, yeah, so first we're going to start just a little bit of an introduction, a little bit uh, expand upon what, what uh, we talked about just a, a few seconds ago. And then we're going to talk about marketing from a kind of before and after perspective, just a recap on that. We'll talk about the value of the email address. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Talk about the value of the email address, how important that is. Uh, email database segmentation. Uh, we're going to talk about implementing online rate guarantees for the David League golf courses. And uh, the ability to predict when you're going to be busy. And sometimes the uh, golf courses are busy on Wednesday and slow on the next Wednesday. We're going to talk a little bit about how you can predict uh, the future. And then we're going to talk a little bit about PPC advertising. And then we'll leave plenty of time for any questions at all if you have any regarding the subject matter or anything else or any other questions you might have. I'd like to talk about a little bit of my background. Uh, in 1987, I started Macro Communications. It's a full service ad agency and marketing company. We've uh, worked and continue to work with some of the larger brands and, uh, and uh, from, from automotive to winery and, and so forth. And then probably more importantly to this audience, 2002, I uh, founded Click for Tea Times. And how many here have uh, heard of Click for Tea Times? A few people and, and uh, Golf Now, another, uh, another one of their third parties. I, uh, I sold that company back in uh, 2006 and I worked as a general manager over at Active for uh, about a year. So I have a pretty good understanding of uh, how that all started, understanding how uh, the uh, online consumer behavior, how that works, how to get people to transact online and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And right now, I have a company called Convert Marketing as well, <coughs> and that one uh, focuses on marketing directly to the golf course industry. So we do marketing technology, we do full service websites and outsource marketing as well as having a couple of, uh, of technology products, an online tee sheet and a competitive analysis. All right, enough about me. that before and after with marketing, I want to kind of recap a little bit of uh, kind of the state of the industry, at least from my perspective. So, you know, a lot of us remember when, uh, when it was all we had to do was open up the doors, put an open sign, and uh, people came in, it was pretty easy. Some of the marketing we might have done might have been brand advertising and newspapers, magazines, pretty simple stuff, maybe a coupon book here or there, but generally speaking, it was a, a pretty easy go. Things were, uh, things were busy. Over slides, all right. <laughs> so then, uh, what happened then? What 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 caused the, the dramatic change? Because there were several factors involved. So, first of all, the economy after 9/11 that certainly had a had a significant effect, impact on our business. Um, you know, in addition, the internet was kind of coming on more more uh, common with uh, people using the internet that affected the, the phones. And certainly, I think most maybe most importantly was a supply and demand issue caused by these other two factors. So certainly too much supply and not enough demand um, had a radical change in the industry, and that's kind of where we are moving to today. So what do we do? We did what the airlines did, we did what the hotels did, and uh, 
search these third parties that came across. One of them was being clicked for D times in golf now. And we leveraged them to help us with the inventory that we had available from, from those open group packages we talked about on the other slide, right? So our T-sheets were, uh, were emptier, not as full. So these companies came along with the promise to be able to fill up the empty spots. And they did. I mean, uh, and, and we did as Clifford for tea times. I mean, we, uh, we, we sold a lot of rounds and, um, and, and put a lot of golfers out on, on your golf courses. Now, what, what did that, how did that affect your golf course? Well, in some cases, I think it helped, right? I mean, we, we certainly put people out there. Um, with that environment, with the aggregate of everybody's inventory together, it became more competitive because now everybody can see everybody's rate on one screen, which prior to these companies coming in, in the, the picture was impossible. Now they compare your rate directly to their competitor's rate, time of day, availability, all those things at once. That tend to drive the price down a little bit, right? I mean, the other factors as well, the economy, the other factors certainly played into that. But having all the inventory showing up on one screen has an effect of driving prices down. Because now you're looking at your rates compared to their rates, and your T-sheet's empty, and, it, and again, you, you drop the price a little bit, which was a little bit of a problem. So, you know, the, the National Golf Foundation came out with a, a recent statistic that 5.9 million people out of a 14.8 million golfers booked using a third party. So it's, a, it, it, it's very prevalent. So people today with you for it now. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about what you can do to kind of offset that. You know, some of the things that I learned with Clifford Tea Times developing that product, those same tactics can be used by each and every one of you guys. I mean, it's a, it's, We'll get into another slides. So, uh, you know, and, and not that people shouldn't use third parties. I'm not. I'm not an advocate for them or against them. It's just a tool. I think that's the most important thing to take from this. Is that third parties are a tool, and they should be used as as one quiver in the uh, in the basket versus the entire basket, right? And now, since that time, there's there's been a, a lot of variety of other ways to market your golf course outside of just using third parties. It's just a fact of leveraging some of these things. We're going to talk a little bit about some of these uh, uh, later on in the presentation. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, realizing that you guys have heard a lot about social media and, um, and I'm, a, I'm a huge, you know, support of social media, but, you know, I, I wanted to kind of skip over that for this particular seminar and focus more on uh, email marketing because they feel that uh, even though that's maybe retro a little bit in somebody's minds, using it properly is still one of the most effective ways to be able to grow the business. That's the way the, uh, the third parties are doing it. That's the way the, the travel offices are doing it. So you're still getting emails from those people. They're still driving new business. So, so we're going to focus a little bit on how to execute a real a strong email campaign. So we're also gonna talk about the value of an email address. And this, this is kind of interesting in my mind, is, is, uh, is how, how valuable an email address is. It may surprise some of you. So this, this slide talks about nearly four times as many emails are sent each day as the total number of Facebook, Twitter, Bing searches, and internet page views combined. So I think uh, I have numbers here somewhere. Maybe I don't. Um, 188 billion, something like that. I think our emails are sent every day. So it's also it's also the only uh, unique address that people have now. It's, it's more sacred sometimes than a social security number, a driver's license number. People are very protective of those email addresses. And that that uh, 55 and over segment of our audience, pretty big golf segment. Those people are. Uh, they're increasing the use of email. Now, the, uh, the younger generation um, is finding email to be kind of obsolete. So that's why, again, the last couple of years we've been really pushing on social media because that's the way we're gonna reach the younger audience. As I mentioned before, it's the it's number one unique identifier. Uh, talk a little bit about just the most requested piece of information. So everywhere you go, every, everything you do, whether it's online, whether it's offline, it seems like everywhere you go, people are asking for an email address. So we're, we're becoming pretty leery of giving that email, email address away, or we have multiple email addresses and we have the, the don't care box or the don't ever want to read box that we, we give out when it's a free drawing or something. And we have our business email and personal email maybe. 
so several different emails that we use. But you have to have one, right? I mean, almost everybody has one. You have to have one to purchase something online, uh, register for something. Almost almost everybody has one. Everybody in our, are relevant in our audience. segmentation. Have people heard about database segmentation before other seminars and so forth? A little bit. So, you know, maybe how you're, you're segmenting your database now, or hopefully you're segmenting your database now, but, you know, some of these things might be members, might be your wrap rate customers, separating your wrap rate customers from a customer who's, who's used a coupon or, or, or purchased a key time at a discount. Seniors, third parties, a good way to segment that database over your general database, pull the third parties out, your wrap rate customers out. Other things you can do though is you can do it by gender. You can do it by hobbies. So the more information you get about your user, the more we can segment that database, the more successful we can be with the email campaign. So you know, as an example, if um, if you're running a, a, a special for a, a woman's event, you know, blasting that out to your entire database, um, you know, it isn't as relevant as it could be if it was just going to women, right? We talked about that, or you heard about that last hour, an hour ago or so. So same thing with, uh, with with playing habits. You'll find out how many people play on Wednesdays, how many people play on Saturdays. Can you get the people who play on Saturdays to play on Wednesdays? So those are ways you can segment your database and really start understanding who you have in your database, almost as if the daily fee acts almost like a private club. We can do that now with database segmentation. So what do you do with email now that you have one? So uh, bounce back strategies, certainly uh, when someone books a round of golf through your website, hopefully you have the ability to uh, trigger them to book another round quickly, right away, give them some sort of offer. And email triggers golf. There's something else that we learned at, at, uh, when we did Click for Tea Times. We, we created golf, and you can too, right? So somebody's at work, they receive your email, and they talk about maybe an afternoon special or Sunday free rain special, whatever the situation is. If they weren't thinking about playing, this is this triggered an emotion. Hopefully, it's got a nice picture on the email. It triggers that emotion to play golf. It gets them thinking about playing golf. And oftentimes, they'll play golf on days when they weren't planning on playing golf due to that email. I mean, we saw that time and time again when we sent out our email with Click for Tea Times, it would immediately spike significantly on rounds of golf within the next 60 minutes after the email went out. Special events, again, if your database is segmented, maybe you find out you have a lot of USC people in your database. You can have USC events, specific events, because you know that that's common in your database. Special offers, we, we talk a lot about that, or you've heard a lot about that. Past customers as well, so maybe someone hasn't booked around to golf in six months or 12 months. Again, with the, with proper segmentation in your database, you can, you can sort, like people haven't booked around in 12 months, send them on an email, and with some sort of offer to come back, or why haven't you booked a survey, something like that. So again, database segmentation is, a, is powerful. So talk about the value of an email address. So this, this, is, this is something I, I find very interesting, something we learned a lot about in, in Click for Key Times. So um, we did a study showing, at least for, for that product, that website, what the, what the lifetime value, this is several years ago, a lifetime value of an email address. Let's, let's uh, have someone guess what, at this, this is uh, several years ago, four click for key times, but, but throw me out a guess what the, the value of that email address is. Anybody have a guess? Anybody? 5,000. Sorry? 5,000. 5,000? Yeah. That's, that's high, but a good guess, I like it. So we, we found out that uh, that each time someone signed up to provide our email address, we made an average of $50 per person. Now this is several years ago. So going along the lines of what the gentleman said though, that was several years ago, and, and each month, each year that went by, the value of the course increases because we find out they play two and a half times a year, or four times a year, whatever that happens to be. So it, it's significant. And, uh, and, and the really the question comes down to, you know, the golfers are, are coming to the facility every day, right? So, you know, what we need to do is we need to find an effective way to capture those email addresses. So, 
how do you get in, right? This is, this is something that you guys have probably done and tried. I mean, uh, when someone comes in, I'm sure you, you've had your, uh, people ask them for their email address, you have a pad of paper, you have a note card, you may have a drawing, a fish bowl, uh, you know, discounting beer, giving away free balls, all, all these things potentially you, you have tried in your facility to uh, feed email addresses. And some of them work. I mean, you do build your email address, uh, your email, email databases. The only issue you have with this, and issues that come come up around, is it's difficult to execute, right? I mean, the pro shop is busy. Hopefully, phones are ringing. It's hard to get someone to to give their email address when they're standing in line. We have two people behind them, and it's inconvenience, right? I mean, as, as consumers, we know now when we go to buy something or pay for something at the point of sale, the very last thing we really want to hear is, "Can I get your email address?" I mean, it's just we're, we're at the golf course, ready to play golf checking in, we're ready to play golf, we're excited about playing golf. It's an inconvenience for us to stop what we're doing and write down our email address. Um, it's an awful good chance too that it's gonna come in that spam area that we talked about earlier. We just put in our little spam when, we, when it's a drawing or something like that. If we're forced to give an email address at that time, the chance of being an email address we read every day is fairly slim. And again, manual entry, having to write those in, put those into the database. Um, it's a like I said, it's, it's a way to do it, but, but there are better ways and there are easier ways now. So, you know, when someone books a tee time online through your golf course's website, they're forced to put their email address in. And, and in fact, when they're doing that, they have no problems putting their email address in. They're used to putting their email address in, right? They put their address, put their credit card information in, the CSV code, the email address, it's just something that they do every single day. So it's not something that is inconvenient, it's easy to do, they're gonna spell it right because Usually we ask them on the checkout process, right, if it's spelled correctly. And they need, they need to use one that they're gonna read because it's gonna have the confirmation on there. So really, at the end of the day, this is something that we feel very strongly about. And there's, there's, there's the TGs have booking engines, there's a lot of different ways to go. Um, the key is to be able to drive those people to your website um, to get them to book online. So that's what we're talking about a little bit today. It's something that, that we feel very strongly about in our company is, uh, is trying to get this to happen, trying to get people to come to your website versus calling on the phone and versus using third parties. So how do we do that? So the best way to do that, and, and again, this isn't a, a revolutionary, right? An online rate guarantee. It's just, it's more evolutionary. I mean, the, the hotel industry's been doing this, the airline industry's been doing this. Um, many of these larger, Industries, we see these things happening, right? Every day, every day when you go to uh, look at Southwest, they're going to tell you to book it online. And in fact, they can only be booked online. This is kind of our mission statement now: is to try to figure out a way to kind of turn the tides and, and take it away from the third parties and bring it online. And this is the key. So why why do people why will people uh, use an online online rate guarantee? So. Step, step back and ask a couple of questions. So, how many people use Travelocity or Orbitz to uh, to find flights for uh, for tickets? Right. So, so pretty pretty common. So, how many people have used Travelocity or Orbitz to find a flight to your destination, Chicago? Say, for example, found the United flight for four hundred dollars, and then gone to United directly, United United.com, and booked around through United.com instead of going Travelocity. Quite a few hands, and that's that's the way that the golf industry is going to get. That's where it's going to end up, right? I mean, the third parties are going to be the aggregate of information, and then as long as we can adhere to an online rate guarantee, people are going to go directly to your golf course to book the round of golf. It's just that it's the way it's going to land. That's the way it is for the other industries. We're just lagging a little bit, so that's the way it's going to just going to the way it's going to end up. Why, why do you do that? Why, why is it that you go to uh, United rather than booking through Travelocity? And someone will put their hand up. Give me, give me a reason why, why you did that. Frequent flyer miles. Frequent flyer miles. Perfect. Loyalty. Right. Anybody else? Why, why else would you do it? Cheaper? Yep. Trust that you're going to the store. Right. Yep. Trust you're going to 
source? I mean, uh, the, the chance of you, which would you rather do? Would you rather call United or would you rather call Travelocity? I mean, you're getting a better chance if you've got an issue with your flight through United than you probably will through Travelocity. Seat assignment, right? Yep. Right. Right. So these, most of these things apply to the golf industry as well, right? I mean, if, if I'm going to book around a golf, I would much rather call the golf course, and I would rather call Click for Keys the golf now. I mean, I, I pretty much uh, can count on a long wait through a third party, and then probably them telling me I'm out of luck, or or it's just, it's, it's going to be a hassle, right? We know that. So. If I know that I can get the same rate or a better rate directly to the golf course, we talked about saving some money, we talked about a, a, a loyalty, we talked about a higher level of service. All these things we're comfortable with going direct. So right now, at, at, at a golf course, and this is this is on average, this isn't necessarily specifically uh, any in particular, but the most of the rounds book it through the phone. Is that is that a pretty fair sentiment to people in the uh, sentiment to the people in the, off, in the uh, audience here? So then third parties, at least in the Southern California area, and you have your walk on, and then, and then number four is, is directly through, through the course of the website. We see very little traffic, at least with the people that we that we deal with. We don't see a ton of traffic of people going directly to the golf course of the website. So what we want to do is we just want to flip it. We want course website to be on top and uh, and then you know the phone third parties walk on the, the other three we're honestly not not as uh, concerned about as long as the majority of the traffic goes through the courses website direct and why do we want to do that anybody why do we want them to go through the course your course directly to book the tea times yes sir uh, well when the, they're calling on the phone the person or people in the golf shop can't or the customers are standing in front of them we want to build a loyalty by using our website. That's right. So time, loyalty, and then we're going to get that all important email address as well, right? So that difficult to get, difficult to find, inconvenience to get the email address, we're going to obtain that as well. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, this online rate guarantee, I wish it was our idea. But it's uh, it's been been done for a long time. It's it's used by the major hotel chains, even even smaller hotels. Use it. All the airlines use it. When you walk off your flight, they say, "Remember to book directly through our website for the best rate." Everywhere you go, you see this. The, the hotels are, are 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 all over. And now that when they did this, that didn't make Travelocity and Orbis go away, right? I mean, they're still around. We still use them, and they still make money. It's convenient. So not everybody is going to come to your website. Not everybody's going to go to Hilton.com to do it, but it's going to be a significant tide change in, in, in the way people behave. There's a few facts about the uh, coming from the booking patterns from independent hotels, which I, th I thought related fairly well to uh, to this audience. Can't read these much, but I can help out a little bit. 72.9 percent of the guests that booked an hotel website specifically search for the hotels on a search engine. That's not uh, probably not too surprising to us and showing us the value of the search engine. We'll talk a little, about, a little bit about that later. 10 hotel websites are visited on average by every new guest before proceeding to final checkout, meaning that they're, they're looking at different hotels, looking at different choices before making their final decision. Same thing goes with the golf industry too. I mean, people are, again, using the uh, third parties to aggregate the information. They find a golf course they're not familiar with. They go to that golf course, they check it out, check out the, uh, the layout, whatever features, um, and then they, they book their round of golf. 20% uh, discovered that hotel through an online travel agency, but booked on the hotel website directly. So what do you need for an online uh, rate guarantee? Well, you, you need a booking engine. And uh, go ahead and let's get to the next slide, please. So you need a booking engine. You need the ability from your website for the, for the consumer to be able to book around the golf. And this is right now an area where, where the industry is really starting to, to get better. I mean, it's a, 
there's still a lot of areas of improvement, a tremendous amount of areas for improvement. This is why we aren't at the same spot as hotels today because of our inability to, to effectively book around a golf from the course of website. The, the course will remain uh, anonymous, but this is a local golf course on their booking engine. You click the book tee time button and this is what, you're, this is what you get. So before seeing if they have any tee times available, before I can see the price, I have to put in my uh, email address and password or create an account just to be able to see the tee times. I mean, if, if it's nine o'clock at night, you're looking to book a round of golf at this place, you know, you're not gonna do it. I mean, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna book it through a third party, you're gonna go to a different golf course. It's just not, not user friendly, we're not patient enough, right? Maybe five years ago, we'd be patient enough to create an account to be able to see, reveal what's inside, but we're not anymore. This is easy links. This is, oh, I'm sorry, oh, sorry. Skipping ahead. So this, uh, this is pretty good, right? This, this is, a, this is a San Juan Hills. You click on book tee times, and it goes directly to a screen that shows the times, the amount of players, and the rates. So this is, this is moving in the right direction to what, what we want to see as a consumer. We want to be able to hit the tee time button, see the tee time, see the rate, book it, and, and, and be done. So who's familiar with this booking engine in the audience? So who, who's, whose booking engine is this? Anybody, anybody know who, who uh, runs this? Yeah, Golf Now, right? Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, wow, I was wondering how everybody got that all of a sudden really quick. Our timing, we gotta, we gotta work on that. Why don't you all come back in in a few minutes and we're gonna work together to try to right, move on. So th this, is, this is a bit of a problem, right? I mean, uh, you know, again, coming from that industry, knowing the inner workings of those industries, knowing how we grew those businesses, we, we did it by email addresses. We really did. I mean, that, that, was, that was how we did it. That's how we, they continue to grow. We talked about the lifetime value of those email addresses. So now you're, you are uh, spending dollars, spending energy, spending time, whatever it is, to get people to come to your website to book around a golf. They did it. They come. They buy it. And this goes through the Golf Now central booking system. So, in, in addition, they, they charge processing fees in, in many cases, not most cases, on, on the golf course's website. This really is a big problem, I mean, as far as I'm concerned. And, and, and it's the most prevalent booking engine there is out there right now. So, although the interface is, is, is nice, the ability to see the times and the prices, and, and one reason that's the case is because that's what they do for a living. I mean, they're, they're professional marketers and they make it as easy as possible for consumers to book rounds of golf, right? But uh, again, the argument might be, well, this is free for my golf course, right? I mean, that's a, it comes with my package with golf now, it doesn't cost me anything, it's free to use, and, and again, it looks better than, better than the previous slide. But just, just be careful. I mean, your, your T-sheets have booking engines. There's other booking engines out there. So just, just be very cognizant of what you're doing, what you're getting into when you put this on your, on your website. Now, I'm, not, I'm certainly not accusing uh, <coughs> Golf Now of, of taking email addresses and then, and then using that email address to sell tee times uh, to your competitors. I'm not implying that, but I'm certainly not uh, um, also saying that they don't, right? I mean, um, you know, the, the email address is coming right through their uh, central booking engine, and uh, emails go out with, with your competitors' courses. It's just, a, again, I'm not gonna harp on it, but it's, it's important, I think, that I want you to understand how strong I feel and how strong I think you should feel about this. There we go, now we're easy links. So this is nice. Um, this is, you know, a, a good booking engine. You went to click tee times, or I'm sorry, you went to book tee times. You came up with a screen that showed the rate, the time, and, and this this is this is great. This is something EasyLinks does, and uh, and again, a year ago, EasyLinks was terrible. EasyLinks was a, was a quarter step ahead from the the other one that we saw. We had to log in first. It was uh, it was bad. So they're, they're getting better, and that's that's good news for all of us who uh, in this industry. Closer we can get to these type of things, the uh, the better chance we're gonna have to be able to have these online rate guarantees. 
So this is this is a booking engine that we have. We're not going to we're not going to uh, harp on it, but it's the same kind of thing where you can find the day, the time of day, book around a golf, and, and be out the door. So so same type of thing. A little bit bit partial on that one, but that's a, just us. We hit on it a little bit, but I want to. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the booking piece. I think that's important as well. So when we try to change the behavior of a, of a golfer, try to, try to change them to come online and book around a golf through our website, rather than using a third party or rather than calling on the phone, having a booking fee on your website is just the wrong, the wrong message. I mean, it's, it's contradictory to what we're trying to do. I mean, if you're, if you're gonna try to push somebody and you're trying to spend energy and effort and money to get them to book online through your course's website, then, then please, you know, the, the booking engine is, is, uh, is, is, is almost an insult to the, to the user who's trying to book around a golf. It should be easy. In, in my mind, it should be a couple dollars less expensive than anywhere else that you find. Um, certainly uh, not more expensive. It should be simple, quick experience, and, uh, and secure shopping. What else you need for the for the online rate guarantee? So signage in your in your point of sale, letting everybody know that uh, the best place to book around of golf is on your uh, on your website. Stance. This this is this is uh, is is important as well. So if someone comes from a third party and they come to your golf course and you realize you're a they they booked around through Golf Now, for example, or clicked a few times. This is a perfect example, a perfect time to take that customer and move them from third party and put them into your database. <coughs> Create a little stamp or, or, a, or a sticker on that receipt, put that thing down there, letting them know that they could have, in fact, found a better rate if they would have gone directly to your website and booked a tee time. So it should just be instilled in their head every time they go, especially the people using a third party. <coughs> and the other thing is, is really an overall buy-in from, from management, staff, everybody at the facility. It's, it's kind of a, it's a paradigm shift, really, in my mind, that, that we should be thinking about here. I mean, it's a, when someone calls on the phone to book around the golf, I think, I think uh, you, should, you should let them know it could be cheaper online. You're happy to help them. You can book them, but you're happy to help, but you can save a couple dollars if they were to go online. So I think that's all coupled together to, uh, to have that online rate guarantee. And again, the familiarity breeds trust, which means you want to see people trust that you have the best rate on the website. Kind of hard on that already. But it does build trust. All right, time to predict the future. So, you know, as I talked about in the beginning of the presentation, it'd be great to be able to find out, you know, why you're busy on one side and you're slow on the following side, right? We all, we all run into these issues. And when, when we started Clipper Tea Times, we noticed that we didn't have those variables. We didn't have those variances. Wednesday, week over week, we would sell within one or two percent of the same amount of rounds every single Wednesday. It was, it was obviously going up, um, but the same amount of people played on Wednesdays through that through, through that system, through the aggregate, right? So the golf course again, they, they see highs and lows in their rounds. So why was it that we didn't see those variations in the golf course level they do? Grab a drink of water and I'll tell you. Competitive set. You have a certain geography, and then a certain, you know, price point that, that creates a small competitive set. Maybe uh, two, three, or four golf courses really fit in your competitive set, and that's all that you need to really worry about when you're talking about inventory and rate. So there's a, there's a micro supply and demand um, equation happening just right in your neighborhood. So if you could if you could go online, and you should go online. And check and see. Go to go to one of the third parties' aggregate sites and check and see how much inventory, what the rates are of your competitors. So, if if uh, two of your competitors, for example, have events that day, you find out that there's no inventory available. I mean, that's a pretty good sign that you're going to be busy that next day because the same amount of people, generally speaking, are going to play on Wednesday. Like I said, we found out out on Clifford Tea Times. So, if two of your competitors have events and you can find that out in advance, 
you should be able to raise your rates a little bit because you know you're going to be busy that day, right? So uh, what, what other factors are involved in, uh, in being able to predict if you're going to be busy or slow in the, in the future? Anybody with a factor? Weather. Weather. That's right. So that's one we've been using for years, right? If it's, uh, it's going to rain on, um, on Thursday, then you know, we probably don't have to staff a pro shop as, as heavily as we would have would been nice, right? Anybody see Moneyball, the movie Moneyball? Raise your hand. So, great movie, by the way. And, uh, you know, as we're mentioning, it's taking a little more of a scientific approach to your course being busy or slow, kind of like Moneyball did in, in, a, in, a, in a strange sort of variance. You just want to use Moneyball. So I had to fit that into the presentation somehow. So, but, but using that, um, that concept of taking numbers, taking how much inventory is built, taking what their prices are, checking to see if people have, have uh, increase or decrease their price from a competitive set, you can really get a good, a good look at what your, what your future is going to look like. One more. So again, being able to check out to see if there's a lack of inventory available in your competitive set, meaning there's a lack of supply and an increase in demand allow you to raise your rates. And uh, this is something that, that that we just don't see much of in the industry. We see a lot of people lowering their rates, trying to trying to buy market share, but we don't see people using the knowledge, things they can find online to be able to increase their rates. And it works. I mean, we uh, we see it with our customers. We see when they have when their when their competitors have events. We just can predict that day is going to be busy. Raise rate a few dollars, and, and they they still sell the same amount around. And of course, we also have a, a, a tool that we uh, offer that provides you an email with all that data right there for you. But again, you can find it on your own. Um, this is just more of a kind of convenience package. So who knows what PPC stands for? That's making sure that it wasn't on the screen when I asked the question. <laughs> Sorry. Price per click. What's that? Price per click. Price per click. Pay per click. Pay per click. Pay per click. Right. Pay per click. Price per click. Same kind of thing. Right. So, commonly known as pay per click, but uh, in this case, we're we're talking about pay per click. So, in one of those earlier slides, we showed all those opportunities between the Facebooks and the Yelps and all these different things that are are free to the golf course they should be on, making sure the social media stuff, the buzz we talk about. We're gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the paid search advertising and the paid uh, Facebook advertising, because dollar for dollar, I, I, I don't see any uh, any better value for a golf course than, uh, than the pay-per-click. It's a, uh, how many people, how many people here are using pay-per-click on there for, to promote facilities, promote membership? And that's just that alone should show everybody in the room the huge opportunity there is for that. So the way pay-per-click works, we'll use Google as an example for now, is uh, you, you know, when people search for a keyword, let's just say golf, for example, the paid area comes up, and you can have an ad promoting anything you want when someone types the word golf in. You don't have to pay for, for this to happen, right? The only time you pay is when they click on it. So you have, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of impressions that come through that you never pay for. The only time you pay is when they click on it, which means generally, fundamentally, that these people are interested in what you have to offer, otherwise they wouldn't click on your link. So I mean, think about that from, from the newspaper advertising or magazine advertising. Let's just say you could go to, go to the newspaper and say, I only want to pay for people who read my ad. Right? That's kind of what, what pay-per-click does on the online world. We're going to, you know, pay-per-click is offered through through all the search engines. Offered through Facebook. There's there's um, a lot of companies that offer this type of uh, payment method. We're going to talk a little bit about Facebook, a little about Google. So we ran a campaign in Southern California for uh, for Get Golf Ready. Developed a micro site and uh, did uh, um, 
quite a bit of different uh, online advertising, including Facebook advertising. So this is a, uh, a Facebook page just kind of showing you what the ad looks like. So again, this ad targets a person who is a golfer. So Facebook not only allows you to target the geographic area you want to, so maybe a, a 20 mile radius or whatever it is around your golf course, you can target the gender, you can target their interests. So if you can target if they like golf. Um, if, if you sell wedding, um, what, what do you think you would target if you were selling weddings? And how many people here sell weddings, by the way? So what, what, uh, what would you target if you're selling weddings and you want to be on Facebook? Potential brides. Potential brides or right, just brides to be. As soon as the status goes from in a relationship, single, to engaged, that very moment that happens, your ad can pop up saying, get married here. This is, this is the venue where you should get married. So that, that's the power of, uh, of the Facebook advertising. You can really target right down to hobbies and interests. So let's say that, you know, certainly targeting golf would be great for this audience, right? But how about targeting <coughs> tennis, people who haven't played golf? If you want to sell lessons, I mean, we all know that tennis is a good correlation with golf, you know, a good parallel. You know, run some advertising, run some paper advertising, promoting golf to people who like tennis. Again, you're not, you're not paying for it unless they're interested in it. So if you run an ad that talks about golf lessons and they have no interest, there's very low likelihood that they're gonna click on your link. Doesn't hurt. So the other thing you can do that, that's phenomenal with this type of advertising is you can split or A-B test. So what that basically means is you're running the same ad but three variations or four variations or two variations of that same ad. So then you have those run simultaneously, meaning that, that one person sees the, the one ad and then the next person is dished up the different ad with the same information, maybe it's a different visual. Could be a different ad copy. Could be a combination of the both. I mean, the, the, the fewer combinations, the better, so you can really get an honest um, idea of which ad is performing better. But that's exactly what this type of uh, testing is for. You know, in this, in this case, we ran three different ads, and the headline was, are you a golf widow? So you can see the three different visuals we used. And then we, we ran these ads to figure out which is going to uh, perform the best. After analyzing that, we, uh, we found out that the second picture had a 50% more click-through rate than the first, and the third picture didn't perform well at all, and it was uh, was later uh, replaced. So it's great information, right? I mean, you find something that's working versus something that doesn't work, and you, you focus on what's working. It's constantly evolving. You can change these things every day. You can change the verbiage, what what, what you're saying. You know, the, the, the one of the keys of uh, pay-per-click advertising or paid advertising is that uh, you want people not to click on that ad as you, as you do for them to click on it, right? You don't wanna be, be broad with your statements on the, these types of ads. You wanna be clear, you wanna be honest. So if, if, you're, uh, if you're running an offer for, uh, for, for tournaments and you're, uh, you're giving away um, a sleeve of balls, for example, for, for anybody who books a tournament, you wanna to be very clear on the ad that that's what you're offering. You don't wanna put in there saying, huge savings on any tournament booked here. Right, because that's going to probably attract a lot of people, and then once they see the offer, they're going to be huge savings. It's a sleeve of balls, and then they're going to bounce, and you paid for them to click on that. So whatever you do, be honest with what it is, and again, you're writing that copy to to have them not click on it as much as you do clicking, because a click is a is a cost. It's a, you know, it's a it's a bidding process. So depending on how popular that word is that you're looking to bid on. Could range from less than a dollar to hundreds of dollars if you want to be on the top of, uh, of the search engine when that word pops up. The beauty is you can uh, you can put limits on how much you're willing to spend. So you can just say that I'm willing to spend two dollars per click. That's all I'm willing to spend, and then based on the bidding processes, where you end up on the uh, on the search engine. So this is still part of that uh, Get Golf Ready campaign. This was a search. 
Uh, search for golf lessons, you can read better than I can. Search for golf lessons in uh, Ventura. Ventura, sorry. So this isn't a huge term that's being widely used from the, the population for search engines, so the, the, the price was pretty competitive for us, and we're able to get the very top with the Get Golf Ready campaign. When we did uh, Los Angeles golf lessons, that's a more competitive area. It's a larger populated area, more people searching. So that price, for the same price we paid for Ventura, we ended up on the uh, on the fourth ad in Los Angeles. It just kind of shows you the kind of how that bidding process works. You can always say that I want to be on the top, and then, and then your price is going to be whatever the higher the highest bid is, right? The penny higher than the next guy. I think uh, this, this was years ago when we did some research, but the, what's the, uh, the cancer for uh, asbestos? The mesothelioma. Yeah, mesothelioma, right? So that was something like $500 per click when it was, you know, do you have this or for the attorneys that represent people who have that, that cancer? Just because it was so lucrative for the attorneys to, uh, you know, if you had it, you found it, you searched for it. Um, Apparently a lot of money to be made. Five hundred dollars might be a little steep for a tea time. So that's a that that is kind of it in a nutshell. So uh, I kind of want to use this time and give us plenty of time. So you guys can ask me questions about anything you want. Things we talked about, third parties, uh, other marketing. If I like walks on the beach, whatever you guys have interest. I think that I think the key is that no matter no matter how many you know when you go to golf now and say you search for the desert for example you search for tea time for Friday in the desert so you're going to see um, certainly a, a ton of golf courses a ton of inventory up there for, for a lot of different golf courses but at the end of the day once you decide you know what course you want to play and what time you want to want to play it for that's that's that trigger point that's when okay I decided I want to play Desert Willow want to play 10 o'clock in the morning. And now that's that's the decision I've made. So so now just like an airline, even though there's more choices in golf, it's still I've, I've narrowed down through the third party where I want to play. And now I know it's Desert Willow. Now I'm just going to go Google Desert Willow, go to their website, check the race there, and ideally make a booking there. I think that to help answer the question too, I think we are lagging a little bit in the in only the fact that. Um, there's a good chance once you get to the golf course, you're going to end up seeing a screen like the first book engine I saw, and that's going to detract you from from booking it directly to the golf course and go back to the third party or, or, or what have you. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yes, sir. Uh, where I was at Florida was a few years ago when third party marketing really first took over, uh, we didn't use them for quite a while. What we found after we started using them was people who wanted to come play our golf course. In Orlando, because just like out in the desert, just you can't swing a dead cat without hitting the golf course. But uh, the people that wanted to play our golf course went straight to our webpage or called us directly and booked it directly with us. If they were coming to Orlando and they just wanted to play golf and they really didn't <coughs> have an idea where they wanted to play or whatever, they started using the third party pieces. And so we picked up a lot of play through the third party because people didn't really have a, a preference on where they played, but when they found us on the third party webpage, and it depended on your brand and who you were and everything, we, we stood out a little bit more. We had that 
bought into what people are. Right. Sure. Yep. No, I agree. I think that that's a that's that's an important an important point too um, on how to leverage the third parties. I think that the uh, at, at the end of the day, the third parties kind of have a niche in that they have their own their own group, their own membership, and if you want to access those people. They, they really use third parties. I mean, that's what they're familiar with using. Um, so I don't know if I'm helping or hurting your point, but I think that today to access those people, you still you still need to access through the third party. You want to access that that market share. The, the key thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, shrink that third party market share and, and have more people look in directly right towards the website. That, as a follow-up, that, that is what did happen most of the time though. After people used third parties the first time to get to our course, then when they came back to Orlando and stayed through our course, then they didn't use the third party. They came directly to the golf course. Perfect. And, and so so I would have to guess that the pricing is a, was the same or better on your website than it was to the third party. Yes. And right. we, we uh, also uh, restricted how, what key types the third parties could use. Right. You know, we gave them our key types that just weren't getting filled just for those people who didn't really know what they wanted to do. Right, that's a great point, great use of a third party again too. I mean, uh, um, you probably don't have a lot of trouble selling your 9 a.m. Saturday tea time, so uh, listing it on a third party not only helps build their brand, and uh, certainly doesn't help build your brand if they're booking it through there. So, uh, you know, limiting the, the times available on those third parties will help as well. But again, something that I mentioned too, the key to the reason why they went this gentleman's course the second time was rate parity as well. So, you know, the rate on, on at your course's website has to be at a bare minimum the same, right? As a third party, and ideally, it, it should be it should be less. I mean, that's a you know, people will make a change for for a dollar or two dollars or no processing fee. So, if, you know, if it's cheaper on the third party, then your website they probably would use a third party, and very very possibly. Use Loyalty or something else that's driving them to, uh, to the course of website. Yes, sir. Can online booking and over the phone T sheet booking both exist at the same time? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's, they're all in parallel. So they're all they all should be talking the same. Yeah. The, the online the, the online booking engines are a extension of your T sheet and your point of sale. So everything inter interacts and interfaces. So if someone books a round of golf through the uh, through the website, it's going to come out of your T sheet as, as being booked and come off your off your point of sale. I'm sorry, off your T sheet. So the phone phone is going to see the same thing. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure if I did. I don't know if I answered a different question or uh, didn't catch it. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I think a lot of time should be spent on the SEO. I mean, we, we didn't cover that in this particular topic, but the uh, you know going back a slide, one one up from there. You know, what this gentleman's talking about is that the top three. It's kind of hard to tell, but the top three have a, a beige tint behind them. Can you see that from where you are? So each one of those are paid. So they paid to get to the top, and that's what you can do through pay per click. So you don't have to. Uh, uh, do anything but shell out a credit card and you can get up to the top. So the, the one right underneath there, um, let's say, uh, I can't read what it says, something Golf Academy, Aroma Golf Academy. So they, uh, they're they there naturally or organically. So they came to the top of the organic search through, through um, good search engine optimization. And uh, that's something that every golf course you constantly be working on. And, and something else that you'll find, this is, you know, back to the third party side of things, though, something else you'll find, that you'll, you'll search for your golf course and the very first one that will come up on the paid is the third party. And oftentimes the very first one that comes on organically for your golf course is the third party. Now, how, how is that possible? I mean, it's your brand, how is that possible? And the reason is, is because um, they have a profile page with your golf course on it. They use, use your golf course in their, uh, the meta tags and search engine optimization work, and more people go to your profile page on Click for Tea Times or Golf Now than they do directly to your website. 
and that's that's how it works. I mean, Google basically uh, pretty smart about that. You, you can't really trick these guys anymore. I mean, years ago there were there were a bunch of different things people were trying to do, uh, but but they're they're constantly evolving. They're constantly protecting that organic search to be relevant for you. And even the paid search, if you uh, if you do a paid search, it's not relevant to what the searcher is uh, looking for. They won't put it up there, even if you write them a check. So to get to the top, you have to be the most relevant in Google's eyes, and that's a, and that's that's why they're they're six hundred and something dollars a share right now. I mean, it's a when you search for something on that search engine, pretty much the the first three are fairly spot on usually, right? So to get your golf course to come up to the top, you have to um, certainly do the right things with the search engine optimization, but you also have to have the traffic. You have to have more traffic coming to your site than, than other places, a huge factor. And a huge factor when you're redoing your website too. To keep in mind that the work that's already been done for the years up to the time you change it, your linking strategies, there's a, we could talk for a, for a long time on, on search engine strategy. Did that, again, that answer your question or confuse it? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? We do happily. Yes, we do. Yeah, we. Uh, our company really is, is, is full service marketing, so we do uh, everything from websites through chart signs. I mean, there's some some companies that we're, we're you know the kind of the marketing department for them off site. 